بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله this is a last minute uh, Black History Month lecture uh, it could have been next Thursday, but next Thursday is not February, so it's no longer Black History Month. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's not sound reason. Anyway, but uh, I think it's a great opportunity as Muslims to learn something about the history of Muslims, primarily Muslims of African descent in the Americas, and how, what are the implications of that? For us, I, I listened recently to a fairly idiotic talk by this Muslim who was interlo his interlocutor was some non-Muslim Southern guy, and they were talking about basically how we don't need Black History Month because if we give if we have Black History Month, then we have to give the Italians, we have to give everyone a month. And, and so, you, what's the problem with that, brothers and sisters, is that everyone is not an indigenous community in this country. There are three indigenous communities. In other words, communities that were firmly established at the time that the country was founded. Those three indigenous communities are the native people, of course, who were generally killed, destroyed, and wiped out. The European settlers and the African slaves. Now, the difference between the European settlers and the African slaves is that before the first Europeans, so they say Columbus discovered America in 1492. An interesting date because that's the date the last Muslims were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula, or the, the end, the fall of Granada, and the end of Muslim political power. The great expulsion was in 1613, after the Inquisition and after the forced conversion of all the Muslims to Christianity, they became what were known as Moriscos. Uh, so in any case, so even before 1492, there's archaeological evidence that Muslims were in the Americas, North, Central, South, and the islands of the Caribbean. Overwhelming evidence. Uh, if you want to read up, one of the most significant books in this regard is a book by Dr. Ivan Van Sertiman. These Muslims who were in the Americas were from West Africa. And in the interest of, of time, In the interest of time, we won't go into some of the evidence that he presents, but it's very strong evidence. Unlike, and so a lot of people, and you'll see this online because it's generally we're living in a very kind of anti-Muslim climate. Muslim does anything you have to, even if it's positive, you have to put some, we say, throw some shade on it. So uh, they say, oh, well, the Vikings were here before the Muslims are. So not to get into who came first contest, but unlike the Vikings or other European explorers, Muslims established uh, relationships with the native people. So there was a textile uh, industry in exchange. There was, ex there was, ex there was a, uh, evidence of a very vibrant trade between West Africa and the Americas and the islands of the Caribbean. <clears throat> anyway, before British colonization, Spanish colonization, so the, the initial colonizers were the Spanish. And the British and French came later and generally further to the north. 
So you end up with Quebec and Canada, which was started as a French colony. So in any case, the Spanish were bringing African slaves to the Americas. The Muslims were very, very rebellious because Muslims did not like being slaves. As a result, in 1522, I, I gave this talk with greater detail because I have more time at the lighthouse. I mentioned Don Carlos Colon, but Don Diego Colon. On the plantation of Don Diego Colon, was the first slave revolt. It was under led by a group of Wolof Senegalese Muslims. Now, the significance of this, not only is it the first organized slave revolt, so the Muslims have been a problem from the very beginning. Not only was the first organized slave revolt, but Don Diego Colon is the son of Christopher Columbus. And so you see the Muslims are integrally wrapped up with the very history of this so-called new world. So much so that Christopher Columbus, Columbus's son's plantation was the site of the first Muslim first slave revolt. And that first slave revolt was undertaken by the Muslims. Now, the Spanish issued several edicts forbidding the importation of Muslims. So these Muslims, what they feared, <clears throat> one of the things they most feared, and they stated this, is that the Muslims would convert the native people to Islam. As a result, we have records of Muslims who were either killed or imprisoned for life for making dawah. So, for example, in, in 1540, near present-day Mexico City, there was a, an escaped slave who ran away. He was living amongst the native people. His name was Pedro Quilafo. Gilafo was the Spanish for Wolof. He was also Senegalese, Muslim. He was boiled to death in a pot of oil, a cauldron of oil, for his activities amongst the native people. So if you think you have it hard, in 1562, in Peru, two Muslims, one by the name of Luis Solano, and another by the name of Lope de la Pena. De la Pena. Luis Solano was killed, and the, the records state for practicing and propagating Islam. And Lupe de la Pena was sentenced to life in prison for practicing and propagating Islam. And so the Muslims not only were maintaining their religion, they were seeking to spread their religion. Which means what? That they weren't ashamed to be Muslims even under the conditions of, of slavery. And so again, how, what relevance does that have for us? What is our attitude on the condition of total freedom? These, these are our ancestors. And this is, and when I say our ancestors, not just people of African descent. They are spiritual ancestors. They belong to every Muslim. Every Muslim should relate to their story. 
Otherwise, those of us who aren't Arab, why should we relate to the Sahaba? Because they're our spiritual ancestors. Why do we relate to the mothers of the believers? We're not blood descendants of them. We're not their great, great to the whatever power grandchildren. Because they are, they are our spiritual mothers. Why should we re relate to Ibrahim? Milita abikum Ibrahim. Because he's our spiritual father. All right, and so these are, spir are our spiritual ancestors. And that's very important. Why? Because in this was on the island, this revolt was on the island of Hispaniola. At the Spanish college, the present home of the Dominican Republic in Haiti. Okay, so and we'll talk about since we mentioned Haiti. So this was Spanish colonization. Muslims were here. Before even British colonies, Muslims are here. Your ancestors, our ancestors were here. And they were not only uh, sacrificing their blood, sweat, and tears for no compensation to build this place. They were being killed, martyred for practicing and propagating the faith. So we should never forget that. So mention Haiti, the Haitian Revolution, the greatest slave revolt in the history of humanity. That's what the Haitian Revolution was. It was the greatest, most successful slave revolt in the history of humanity. At the heart of it, there were two Muslims. One is Mekendad, Mandinka. Mekendal was an alim. He was totally fluent in Arabic. This is the records. Now, now we're now the French. Same island. Oh no, Haiti, under French colonization. Massive coffee and sugar plantations. Mekendal was working in the sugar press. One of the features of the sugar press is that when slaves are feeding the Canaan to be crushed, if their hands got caught, their arm would be chopped off because it was cheaper to get a new slave than it was to stop the press. So Makanda had his right hand was chopped off. Eventually ran away and he was at large. He was sought by the French. He lived in the mountains of present-day Haiti and Dominican Republic for 18 years, wreaking havoc on the plantation and the owners, the slave owners. He specialized in poisoning their wells and some of them also. The French claimed he was responsible for 6,000 deaths. He was resisting. He was finally captured. He escaped, and then he was recaptured, and he was killed in 1752. But he helped to lay the groundwork for the Haitian Revolution. Closer to the actual time of Haitian liberation, the great uprising, one of the leaders was Bookman, who came to Haiti from Jamaica. Bookman was a nickname given to Muslims because Muslims were known to carry their Qurans around with them. So they were called Bookmen. So Bookman came from Jamaica to Haiti, and he led the great slave revolt, finally being killed in 1791. So two of, them, two of the greatest figures in Haitian history 
two of the, the greatest instigators of Haitian independence were Muslim, Makandal and Bookman. Now someone would say, well, the revel, the revolt it was it couldn't have been all that. Look how poor Haiti is today. You know why Haiti's so poor? You have a little a uh, uh, a small nation. Because the Haitians paid in today's terms, from the time of their independence until the 1930s, almost $30 billion in gold to the French as reparations. So next time a European tells you they don't believe in reparations, say you believe in them when someone's paying them to you, like the Haitians, and Haiti honored that. Which, for the, because thousands of plantations were destroyed. And the independent Haitians agreed to pay the French slave owners, colonizers, reparations. And that basically drained Haiti of all the finance capital that could have been invested in building up the island. That's why Haiti's, amongst other reasons, there's some other significant reasons is impoverished to the extinct extent it is now, but that doesn't undermine the fact that they fought for and they secured their independence. And they drove the French off of their islands. And the greatest and most successful slave revolt in human history. So again, notice the dates. We're just beginning to see the birth of the United States. But even before that, during the time of the British colonies, <clears throat> so during the time of the British colonies, you have Muslims who are being brought into the Americas. Perhaps the most famous was a Fulani, Fulo individual, was an alim. He was the son of the leader of his people who came from a place at the time he was taken into bondage in 1731. And notice 1731, America is not America yet. This is the British colonies. He was taken into slavery on his way back to his homeland of Bundu in eastern, present day eastern. Senegal, close to Guinea. Ayub bin Suleiman. Ayub bin Suleiman, known in these parts says Job bin Solomon. His biography written by an individual by the name of Thomas Bluent, B-L-U-E-T-T, -T, is called the fortunate slave. Uh, just to show the place of Muslims in overall African-American history, this is the oldest extant work of African-American literature. It's the oldest existing work about an African in the, American, um, in the Americas, The Fortunate Slave. I saw an original copy at the Schomburg Museum in New York City. Why was he the fortunate slave? As we said, he came to Annapolis, Maryland, 1731, sold into bondage in Kent County, Maryland. Like many slaves, he ran away. The reason he ran away, so he ran away, when they caught him in Pennsylvania, he told them he's a Muslim, he wrote Arabic, they couldn't read Arabic. <clears throat> Probably they couldn't, they couldn't read anything. Because remember, universal public education didn't start until the mid-19th century. 
under the leadership of Jules Ferns in post-revolutionary France. So generally, people couldn't read or write. For that reason, many of the Muslim slaves who were totally literate in Arabic, they became the bookkeepers of the plantations. Because the numbers, you could recognize those. In any case, fortunate slaves, so he's captured. He's brought back to his plantation. What usually happens when a runaway slave is brought back to the plantation that he or she ran away from? And you see roots. What happened to Kunta Kente slash Toby when he kept running away? They're beaten brutally. Then they finally chopped his foot off. Say, so you're not going to run away anymore. Ayub bin Suleiman, the fortunate slave, his owner asked him, why'd you run away? He said, I couldn't pray in peace. I'm doing my salat and your bratty kids are pouring, pouring dirt on my head. So he said, oh, we could fix that. He gave him a musalla. He said, you pray in this room. He's the fortunate slave. He still wasn't happy because he was from a, a, a cattle pastoral people. So they put him over the livestock. Still wasn't happy. He wrote a letter in Arabic to be taken to his father back in Africa to send gold to purchase his freedom. Remember, his father was the leader of his people back in Bundu. The letter was sent. He heard that uh, Captain Pike, who was the captain of the ship that had brought him to Annapolis, that the ship had returned a year later. He sent the letter to Pike to take back to Africa. When the letter reached Annapolis, Pike had sailed on to England. The letter was sent to England. When the letter got to England, Pike had sailed on to West Africa. The letter ended up in the hand of James Oglethorpe. Anyone who know who wasn't at the lighthouse last week? Who James Oglethorpe is. Actually, someone last week they knew. James Oglethorpe was to become, once he went to the American colonies, one of the founders of the originally slave-free colony of Georgia. But at this time, Oglethorpe was in England. Oglethorpe sent the letter to Oxford University where it was translated from Arabic into English by one of the Orientalist scholars. Oglethorpe was so intrigued by the erudition of Ayub bin Suleiman, he sent the money to Maryland to purchase his freedom. He's a fortunate slave. Now he was in bondage for 18 months. He left America, or the British colonies, in 1733. Six weeks sailing across the ocean he learned English because he didn't learn English during those 18 months. These are adults. You drop a kid anywhere. If they're from three years old to eight years old, they'll learn the language in six months. No accent. Adults don't learn like that. Adults working on a slavery plantation definitely don't learn like that. Adults in an environment where you're beaten if, you, if it's found out that you're learning to read or write, definitely don't learn like that. And so a lot of people will, will condemn and say, African Americans, why do you speak these Ebonics? Why don't you all learn the Queen's English? When you get beaten for learning the Queen's English, you tend to develop other means of expression that don't always conform to the rules that have been laid down by the queen to speak in the most distinguished and intelligible way. Anyway, he's a fortunate slave. He learns English six weeks on the boat, gets to England. He's so impressive that he he starts debating in English the scholars at Oxford and Cambridge, and they're so impressed. Actually, I have a picture of him. 
So uh, I need to dispatch someone to my car. You have the key. Go get the book out of the back seat. Thank you, young man. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Most importantly, a decent guy. <clears throat> so we have a picture of Ayub, Ayub bin Suleiman. Uh, he has an audience with the queen. He's inducted as a full member into the Spalding Regent Society, at the time the most prestigious academic society on earth, whose membership included Sir Isaac Newton and Alexander Pope and A.U. bin Suleiman as a full member, not an honorary curiosity, as a full member. Much of what we know about his life comes from the record of the Spalding Regent Society. His portrait was painted. Now this shows, again, this is a lesson for us. He was wearing European clothes. He had been sold into bondage. He's in England. He refused to be painted in anything other than his native dress. And so when the artist who painted him, he said, how, how can I do that? I've never uh, seen your native dress. He said, you got pictures of Jesus everywhere in his native dress and you never saw him. <laughs> so he described it. And so based on his description, the artist paint the picture that you'll see momentarily, inshallah ta'ala. So he's the fortunate slave. He gets an audience with the queen. The queen uh, outfits him with a shipload of the latest books and scientific instruments etc. makes him a full agent of the Royal uh, African Company, which isn't necessarily a good thing, and then sends him back to Africa as a free man, fortunate slave, Ayub bin Suleiman. While he was in England, one of the things he did, he wrote three copies of the Quran from his memory. I have a photocopy of one of the pages of one of those Musafs. He was, he was, he was trained and that's why he could debate. He was trained in rhetoric, logic. Thank you, sir. A gentleman and a scholar, as I said. Most important, a decent guy. This is Ayub bin Suleiman as he was painted by the artist based on his description. This is how, my, this is how you paint me in my dress. So what is the, the point for us? Don't be ashamed to look like a Muslim? No, don't, don't be ashamed to look like a Muslim. It's, it's good for your health. And if you think it's tough, this is, this is Ayub bin Sur, he just came out of a situation of bondage. And they never broke his will. They never stole his dignity. Because no one can steal your dignity. You can only give it away. As Muslims, you shouldn't give it away. It's not for sale, and you're definitely not getting it for free. So, the fortunate slave. Now, when he's going back to Bundu, he has guns and pistols, because the queen hooked him up. And he also has a European travel uh, companion. I forgot his name. They encountered the same they, they encountered the same slaving party that had kidnapped him and sold him to Captain Pike. So he's ready to pull out his gun and start blasting. But his European companion, he said, no, they outnumber us. Because, you know, they had those old school guns. And when you put the shot, this gunpowder and so he might have gotten one of them, boom. So he said, no, we can't do it that way. We're outnumbered, so just relax. So then they didn't recognize him. He has these European clothes on at this point. It's been a few years. So he uh, asked him, you remember this Fulani guy who sold to Captain Pike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They said, a funny thing happened. We sold a guy, and we got some guns, amongst other things, and we gave one of the guns to our king as a gift. Then one day, the gun went off and killed the king. 
He said, okay, I don't need any revenge. Allah is great. So he's the fortunate slave. Now, this is British colony. Right after independence, same date, 1731. Ibrahim Abdurrahman is captured in a battle, sold into slavery, sails across the Atlantic, across the Caribbean, an arduous journey, he ends up in Natchez, Mississippi. Like Ayub bin Suleiman, some of you saw the PBS kind of, what would you call that? It's half feature film, half documentary. He runs away. But he soon consigns himself to his fate and he goes back and he becomes again, he becomes the bookkeeper of the plantation. And so Mr. Cox, who owns the, or Foster, who owns the plantation, won't sell him at any price. Now, he was, he's called Prince. You can read his book. So, a beautiful book, a beautiful, well-documented, thorough book. The whole book is about Ibrahim Abdurrahman. It's called Prince Among Slaves by Terry Alford. Highly recommend it. Now the thing, he was called prince because of his regal uh, stature. He carried himself like a prince. The reality was he was a prince. He was the son of Ibrahim Sori. Ibrahim Sori was the, after Karamako Alfa, the unifier of the Fulani people in present day Guinea, Futa, uh, Futa Jalon. He was the son of Ibrahim Sori, Maudu, the great. He was a prince. And there's something interesting in his story. While he was a young man, now both Ayub bin Suleiman and Ibrahim Abdurrahman studied in Timbuktu. So I was blessed to go to Timbuktu. It was, it was overland. It was, it was, you understand, if you go to Timbuktu, why Timbuktu is like a, a, a metaphor for a distant, far-off place. So even in American lore, Timbuktu has its place. Some of you remember uh, the 1920s New York Yankees. Anyone baseball fans? Uh, you could be a Muslim man. Good. You're not wasting your time with that nonsense. But... Babe Ruth, now how many, uh, Babe Ruth, All right, how, how many of you heard of Lou Gehrig? Remember Lou Gehrig, he, he had ALS, and he, in fact the disease is named after him, Lou Gehrig's disease. So they would say, come on babe, come on Lou, hit that ball to Timbuktu. <laughs> or was it Kalamazoo? <laughs> Whatever it was. Timbuktu is far, but it was one of the greatest centers of learning in the history of this Ummah. One million manuscripts to this day in Timbuktu. Every religious and worldly science is captured in those man manuscripts. So they studied there. I went there. I'm praying everywhere. I pray. I pray that they prayed here and praying, making dua. Get some of that. Allahu Akbar. In any case, so uh, Ibrahim Abdurrahman, this would be 1791. He comes in Natchez, Mississippi. When he was a young man back in Futa, Futa Jalon, a European explorer was lost. His father's soldiers found this guy, brought him to their town, nursed him back to help. He passed through Natchez, Mississippi. He saw Ibrahim Abdurrahman in the marketplace and he was stunned. He said, 
This man's father saved my life. He went to Mr. Foster and he begged and cajoled. He tried. He wouldn't. He said, Prince is not for sale at any price. As Prince was literally running the plantation. Not for sale. 1827, fast forward. After all these years in bondage, he writes a letter in perfect Arabic, West African script, to be sent to the king of Morocco. Now that shows several things. Number one, he was able to retain his literacy. He was able to retain, why are you just dispensing with this? I mean, he was able to maintain his literacy after all of those years in bondage. That's very important. How was he able to do that? If you read the book that, that when it's Sylvian Diouf's book, amongst others, I just hold it down here. Uh, Qurans were circulating on the plantation. When the situations allowed, this is especially popular in Jamaica and Brazil. Slaves are actually learning in Brazil in madrasas. They had their low hat. They were recreating uh, the, the educational foundation that's needed for the Muslim community. Uh, slaves would ask for slaves who are going to Africa to bring them back masahib. Bring them back copies of the Qur'an. And so sometimes they would write in the dirt. They write in the dirt the various chapters of Qur'an, then erase it. So they have means to maintain their literacy. It also shows the networks that the slaves had established, uh, that rather the African Muslims had established amongst themselves in West Africa. Uh, and those that reached across the Sahara. Because the relations between Muslims in Africa, until the Morocco, Moroccans invaded Sunghe and overthrew and captured Gao on the Niger River. And Askia Muhammad fled down river with 2,000 canoes. And so this was 1599. There was no armed Arab invasions of Africa. So you'll find some non-Muslim Pan-Africans say the African, the, the, the Arabs, they won't say Arabs, the Arabs. The Arabs invaded Africa and forced the conversion and Islam's not a true African religion. That's hogwash. Islam spread peacefully in Africa, starting with the Najashi during the time of the Prophet وسلم, in Ethiopia. And then from that time forward, through the, the schools, through teachers, through mystics, through various peaceful means. So when, when the Moroccans invaded in 1599, all of that area, the entire Sahil was already Muslim. And so when they got to Timbuktu, they found a great center of learning that was at that time presided over by a great Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, who they feared so much they exiled him to Morocco. When he got to Morocco, he couldn't even have a halakha like this. His level was too high. So he established a halakha to teach the qadis, to teach the judges, and the, the muftis. That's who were in his halakha. Rahimahullah. So this, this was Islam in Africa. And all these great luminaries studied there. And then they were brought to this land. They were alims. They were scholars of the religion. His letter ended up in Morocco, the U.S. Embassy in Tanja, Tangier. And then it was sent to the king of Morocco. Now, Morocco has a distinction. This is also something that the, the Muslim-hating people don't tell you. 
Morocco was the first independent sovereign nation to extend diplom diplomatic recognition to the newly established United States of America. I have a copy of the, the, the treaty. And where is it at? Somewhere. It used to be on the thing. I'm trying to think. Where'd it go? I'm in a smaller space right now. It's all good, though. I have it somewhere. The point is, so the king of Morocco sends through the ambassador at Tangier, uh, Tangier, Tanja, he, the ambassador, sends a request to Henry Clay. Henry Clay was the Secretary of State at the time. Henry Clay gives a request to President John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States. John Quincy Adams sends a personal request and the money to liberate Ibrahim Abdurrahman. And he tried to gather the money. He was able, touring the north, to free his wife and two uh, I think two of his children, the other four or five had to stay behind, and he sailed back to Africa as a free man. These are your ancestors. These were Muslims who were practicing Islam. There, there are records of Muslims fasting Ramadan on a starvation diet. The average lifetime of a, of a slave was 15 years. Why? Because it's expensive to take care of old people. Some of you uh, were, last night, we had a, a little lesson. I read a text message that came from a friend of mine who goes way back to the Air Force. And he lives in Ohio now. He sent the text message. He said, I don't mind getting old. It's the medical problems I hate. <laughs> it's expensive to take care of old people. They say we don't have socialism, right? Our president, America will never be a socialist country for poor people. That's what he should have said, because we have socialism for the rich all day long. You want an example of socialism for the rich? You, you look at all, all these corporate tax breaks. Who is going to give Amazon $3 billion to build a factory in Queens? The New York state government with taxpayers' money to go right into Mr. Bezos' pocket. That's called socialism for the rich. $3 billion. Anyway, that's called socialism for the rich. A few million dollars for WIC or food stamps. These leeches. We have another form of socialism. They say, we will never have a national socialist medical program. We already do. 70% of every healthcare dollar spent in this country is spent by the government for Medicare. There's all the old folks in the nursing homes and the skilled nursing facilities and the assisted living facilities who are being paid by Medicare, your tax dollars, constitute 70 cent of every health care dollar. That, my friends, is called a public national health care system. And no one's going to mess with it. That other 30 cent, that's what's being contested. Why do I say that? Slave owners isn't going to put out that kind of money to take care of old people who can't work. So they literally work the slaves to death. So you wouldn't have any old people on the plantation. It's a fact. 15 years, there's the lifespan of the slave. Literally work to death, which means what? A semi-starvation diet. Starvation diet, no energy to work. Just enough surplus energy from that diet to work in those fields 
but not enough to maintain strength and vitality for very long, so you work yourself to death. On that diet, Muslims were fasting. So don't tell me when you get out of your air-conditioned car, house rather, and jump in your air-conditioned car and go to your air-conditioned job, I can't fast, I'm working. Don't, don't do that, brothers and sisters. Think about your ancestors working in the sweltering heat in Mississippi, and Alabama, and Georgia, and Louisiana in the summertime. 100 degrees with 98% humidity, fasting Ramadan. This is documented. This is documented. To read about it. Sylvia Diouf talks about this in her book, Servants of Allah, African Muslims Enslaved in the Americas. All right, so right at the inception of the nation, you have Muslims. Civil war, right on the eve of the civil war. Omar bin Suleiman. Omar bin Suleiman, uh, Omar bin Said whose diary was recently released by the Library of Congress. You can download it for free, along with the English translation. Omar bin Said wrote a 30-some-odd page autobiography, the one I just mentioned. Omar bin Said wrote a section of the Risal of Ibn Abi Zayd al-Khairawani that still exists. It's a very prolific writer. They said he converted to Christianity. One of the last things he wrote, and all of this is in Arabic. He wrote everything in Arabic. One of the last things he wrote was, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ نَصْرٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَفَتْحٌ قَرِيبٌ وَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He meant from Surah Nasr and Surah Saf, merged it together. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا So, did he convert? They thought he was writing the Lord's Prayer. Over oh, here, Jim Bog, look at here. My slave can write the Lord's Prayer. Look at here. See, he read in Arab, Arab language. Look at there. He says the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Good thing they couldn't read Arabic. Omar might have gotten in trouble. Sitting Bull used to do that also. They'd put him on a train and truck him around. Come see Sitting Bull, and he's cursing them in his native tongue. What's wrong with these <laughs> oppressed people? <laughs> Need to learn how to act. So Omar bin Said. Now, Omar bin Said died around 1860, right at the beginning of the Civil War, thereabouts. After the Emancipation Proclamation and slaves stopped coming in, new slaves, with the abolition of slavery, the Muslim communities and the Muslim presence amongst the slaves began to die out because people could practice Islam, they could fast if they wanted to. They could wear their, their native garb when they could afford clothing. Many slaves were naked. Like what you see in movies like 12 Years a Slave and Django and all, that's just Hollywood. Many of these slave owners wouldn't clothe their slaves because they wouldn't spend the money on clothes. And Sylvia and Diouf talks about that also because that was an expenditure. The average slave earned for their master $257 back then. Today, that will be many thousands. The upkeep was $13. And so look at the profit rate. $13 upkeep, $257 in income from the average slave. That, that's the American, that slavery... You can read, uh, I think is Eric Williams, uh, talks about how slavery established 
the surplus capital in the 19th century that allowed America to become a 20th century superpower. That's a fact. The thing you, you're talking about in today's dollars, trillions of dollars, I'm talking over 200 years, trillions of dollars of free labor. So what do you do with that surplus? You invest it in the factories and the infrastructure that, and in the military might and the battleships that paved the way for this country to become a superpower. Anyway, so the, the Muslim presence begins to fade. Vestiges of it, the famous Work Progress Association study in the 1930s, Sapelo Island in Georgia and the coastal islands off the coast of Georgia where people talked about their grandmother or grandfather praying five times a day, facing the east, bowing down. So there were, as late as the 1930s, there were recollections of enslaved ancestors by family members who saw them practicing Islam with their own eyes. And there are other things, time doesn't allow, but generally uh, the, the Muslim presence died down. Now there's a very significant figure here as time expires. <clears throat> Who began uh, by creating the consciousness so the Muslim presence dying down, the most dominant institution in the life of African Americans, primarily in the South, is the black church. And so you have a very strong uh, hold by Christianity on the lives of black folks. Uh, this individual, Edward Blyden is instrumental in opening up the psychological space for African Americans to begin contemplating Islam again. A household Blyden uh, in the 1850s, he wants to go to Queens College, presently a part of Rutgers University in New Jersey, uh, to study. They say, sorry, Ed, you're a black man. Can't study here, but we'll cut you a deal. We'll send you to Africa as a missionary. What a deal, right? You can't study here, but you can go propagate the religion that runs the school that won't let you study in it. He took, he, he, he took the deal. So Blyden goes to West Africa, uh, ostensibly as a missionary. Well, in West Africa, now, now Blyden is a Pan-Africanist. Blyden has begun to study African people in the diaspora. So all around what's called the Black Atlantic, the Caribbean, uh, Brazil. Get, all right, should we come back after Asia and finish? All right, we'll come back after Asia. Routes through the through uh, the, the schools, the Sankori University, Muslims are coming from all over the world to Timbuktu. And so there are networks that are established. Blyden that, and Blyden, being a Pan-Africanist, he says and he posits that maybe if Islam is spread amongst the African peoples in the diaspora, it can unify the people. And so he Amongst other things, he writes a book, a very influential book, in the latter half of the 19th century, in African American intellectual circles. Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race. So as I said, so in an intellectual circles, people begin to contemplate Islam as the foundation of a solution to the problems of African people in the diaspora. And so this space was opened up 
to a, to a large extent by the work of Edmund Blyden. Now, there's a historical question here. Did Blyden ever become a Muslim? Did he convert? There's a debate. Some say he did. Some say he didn't. But his books were very influential, and probably this is the most influential of his books. And you can get it if you want to read it. It's available. It was reprinted by Edinburgh Press uh, a couple of decades ago. Edinburgh University Press, excuse me. Now, as we move into the 20th century, so generally speaking, the presence of Muslims is dying out. But thinking about Islam is starting to uh, manifest itself. Now, you have something at the beginning of the 20th century that revolutionizes the nature of the African-American community here in the United States. I mean the United States. <clears throat> what happened during this period in African-American and then wider American history? No. I mean, yes, but not of primary import. The great migration from the south to the north. So you have the creation of these massive northern ghettos. These new communities are cut off from the full impact of the black church. That being the case, experimentation with new forms of religious expression began to manifest themselves. The first of these in Newark, New Jersey in 1913, when a man by the name of Noble Drew Ali Not Newark, California. Establishes the Moorish Science Temple. Now the Moors, Moor, this is the Spanish word for Muslim. And we even to just skip back very quickly, in the interest of time, when we were talking about the Spanish in the early 1500s, we could have mentioned Columbus himself. Columbus, in his journals, when he sailed uh, past the southern coast of Cuba, he noted that there was a beautiful mosque on the hill near the shore. Cortez, in his diary, now Columbus, these were all, this is the height of the Inquisition. They all knew how to recognize a mosque. Cortez, when he gets to Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, he notes in his journal that there are beautiful temples and mosques, both. If he said beautiful mosques, someone could say he meant temples. If he said beautiful temples, they say, yeah, he meant temples. He said there are beautiful temples and mosques. And we mentioned how the Spanish feared the spread of Islam. What was the rallying cry of the conquistadors in the Americas? San Diego Matamoros. San Diego, St. James the Muslim Slayer. San Diego, Matamoros, St. James, kill the Muslims. That was the rallying cry in the Americas. And we know there are cities called Matamoros scattered throughout the Americas. Why is that? Question that awaits your serious research and investigation. But back to the 20th century. So the Great Migration creates this space, people being cut off, not totally, because the church goes, but the full sociological and socializing impact of the black church remains in the South. 
And in these northern ghettos that are created through the Great Migration, you begin to see other forms of religious expression. One of these being the Moore Science Temple. Eventually, in 1930, in Detroit, Michigan, you have the beginning of the Nation of Islam. From Detroit, Temple Number One, to Chicago, Temple Number Two, to Washington, D.C., Temple Number Three. And then when Malcolm comes in, but we'll get to that, you have the, the Nation of Islam really taking off. Before then, though, so you have the, the Moore Science Temple. You have individual who's not a Muslim, but again, to show how Islam is intertwined in African American history, probably one of the greatest pan-African movements in the history of the African American people is the United Negro Improvement Association under the leadership of Marcus Garvey. Now, Marcus Garvey was Jamaican. Garvey goes from Jamaica to London. In London, <clears throat> there is a Sudanese Egyptian individual, some theory says an African American, uh, who's running a pan Africanist newspaper with an Islamic flavor. And that individual is Duse Muhammad. So Duse Muhammad becomes Marcus Garvey's mentor. So Marcus Garvey was mentored by a Muslim. They both leave London. Marcus Garvey goes to Harlem and he starts the UNIA. Duse Muhammad, so these, we're talking late teens, early 1920s. Duse Muhammad goes to Detroit. And in Detroit, he starts a multinational, multi-ethnic uh, Islamic organization with the Iraqi Shis and Sunnis, the Lebanese Shis, with the uh, other Muslims migrated there, African-American converts, white converts. Uh, they form a very powerful Islamic organization that influences Islam in Detroit to this very day. If you want to read about that, there's a book called uh, Old Islam. In Detroit. Fascinating story. Old Islam in Detroit. And you can see Duse Muhammad, a committed Muslim who starts this organization, is the mentor of Marcus Garvey. Now, Marcus Garvey has two very illustrious students. One is a writer for his newspaper, and one is an organizer in the UNIA, one of his principal organizers in the Midwest. Who are those two individuals? Earl and Luis Little. Who are Earl and Luis Little? Malcolm X's parents, Omaha, Nebraska, and subsequently outside of Lansing, Michigan. Earl Little is the organizer. Luis Little was one of the chief writers for the Garveyite newspaper. So Malcolm didn't grow up uh, in a house. Malcolm told his teacher he wanted to be a lawyer because he grew up in a home where there was intellectual life, in a home where there was activism and organizing. That's the, 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 the cauldron that shaped and forged Malcolm X. And then his hopes were dashed, and his father was murdered, his mother was driven crazy. He ends up out in the streets. He goes to the East Coast. He lives with his sister. He drifts, but then he eventually, he comes back to his roots. It's as if he were laying in that jail cell and he heard a voice. Malcolm, 
Remember who you are. You are my son. Malcolm wakes up and he goes back to save the kingdom. Wait, that's the Lion King. How do we get... Anyway, you get the picture. So, Malcolm X comes out of this home. And eventually, in the mid to late 40s, mid 40s, Malcolm X joins, Malcolm Little joins the Nation of Islam and becomes Malcolm X. That history is pretty well known. What's not well known is that during the same time, so if we go back to 1920, around that time, uh, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. He was an Ahmadi scholar of Islam from India. The Indians had to live with the African Americans. All people, contrary to popular myth, a lot of Indians are dark skinned people. So they're put in the ghetto. He starts propagating Islam amongst African American peoples on the East Coast. He builds a movement. He's a very knowledgeable person. He attracts very talented individuals. Amongst them, Sheikh Wali Akram. Wali Akram is an African American convert who has a patent for the railroad coupler for train cars. So when Mufti Muhammad Sadiq leaves America, he's succeeded by an individual who doesn't know Arabic and isn't a scholar. He's, so he tries to teach a group of African-American converts Urdu. Urdu is a beautiful language. But as a convert, I can tell you, when you convert to Islam, you want to learn Arabic, not Urdu. Now, I mean, chicken tikka musalla. You want the basics, samosa, biryani, food. You want to be able to eat well. But you want to learn Arabic. And so when Mufti Muhammad Sadiq goes, all of these people who are with the Ahmadis, they become Sunni Muslims. And they go on, Sheikh Awali Akram goes on to form the first Cleveland Mosque. So we're talking the early 1930s. Simultaneously, you have people who are coming out of that particular movement and others who form the first Pittsburgh mosque, Ezzeldin Village, a Muslim village outside of Philadelphia. You have uh, uh, a little later on, uh, uh, Sheikh Dawood Faisal and his wife, Mother Khadija, in New York City, in Brooklyn. So you have a, a, a number of Sunni Muslim organizations emerging. Then in the 1920s, I mean, excuse me, 1960s, so this is, we're talking what I just mentioned, 1930s. So as the Nation of Islam is building, these Sunni uh, movements are also building up in the African American community. And, and so you have a, a very strong Muslim presence in the African American community, primarily in the urban centers of the North. You have the Moor Science Temple. You have a lot of Moors. They wear fezes. Their, their, their book is in the Quran. They call it the Quran, but it's the Quran, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Bible mixed together in interesting ways. Uh, but still, this, this Moorish, Muslim presence, they have their temples. You have the Nation of Islam. You have these various Sunni Mus uh, movements all coming together in the community to establish a very uh, high profile for Islam amongst African American people, primarily, as I said, in the urban centers of the North. You also have a lot of very prominent jazz musicians converting to Islam. 
which also raised uh, Ahmed Jamal and, and many others. Uh, so uh, Daoud Suleiman. These, these also raised the profile because these are celebrities. And we know the power of celebrity, don't we? Khabib. Here's, here's pre-Khabib fight, Muslim kid going to school. Post Khabib fight. After he knocked McGregor out, like, hey, he's one of us. If he could do it, I could do it. So celebrities have that power. And so you have a very, very high profile uh, in, in the community during these decades. Then in the 60s, you have a number, Malcolm starts his, he leaves the nation, he starts Muslim Mosque Incorporated, he brings say, Sheikh Hassoun from the Sudan, and when Malcolm's killed, that morphs into several different movements. You also have the emergence of uh, the Darul Islam movement in New York City. Uh, and you have in DC, the uh, emergence of the Islamic Party of North America, Muzaffaruddin Hamidullah. You have these various movements coming together, coming together, and Islam is a very positive liberational force because they're all focusing on black liberation. So this is, this is a very prominent movement. Now the Darul Islam movement splits in the 1980s. A sheikh from Pakistan, Sheikh uh, Jilani, comes and pulls a lot of people, and then this be, uh, this begins the movement of the fukara, which usually is called the fukra. And so a lot of people who were in the Darul Islam movement first go to Afghanistan to try to fight the Soviet Union, uh, start to establish ur uh, rural communities and compounds. There's one in Fresno. But I think the brothers and sisters moved from there to South Carolina, upstate New York, and various parts of the country. And then you have the part of the Dar that didn't go with Jilani. And that part of the Dar, eventually, Imam Jamil al Amin becomes affiliated. H. Rap Brown takes his Shahada and becomes affiliated with that strain of the movement. So you have the nation, you have the Moore Science Temple, you have the Islamic Party of North America. You have the, the Darul Islam movement. This is moving up the 70s, 80s, a little later on. And here we are today. Now, the, the, what lessons can we take from this history? As we see, number one, that this is Muslim history in America. This isn't just African-American Muslim history. And People make a terrible mistake because when, when African-American Muslims assert some sort of independent history and identity as part of the ummah, so it's black nationalism. But when other Muslims assert uh, their ethnic identity, we say, oh, they're Bosnian Muslims. So they're Egyptian Muslims. They're Sudanese Muslims. They're, they're Pakistani Muslims, to be clearly distinguished from Bengali Muslims. Right or wrong? And so, there, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as we're unified in terms of our purpose, our focus, and our sense of mission. The Prophet Al-Adhan al Habasha. The then is for the Ethiopian. Al Hikmatu Yemeni. Al Hikmatu Yemeniya. Wal Iman Yemeni. Faith and wisdom are Yemeni. When Tatawalla Yastabdil Kauman Gaira Kum Thummala Yakuna Am Thalakum. Wa Wada Kafa Kafata Sharif Ala Katfi Salman al Farisi Wakal Huwa Wakomuhu. Salman, the Persian and his people. So ethnic national identity is a part of our religion. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhannas inna khalaqnaakum wakarin wa untha wa ja'annaakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. I've made you into nations and tribes. 
that you recognize each other, not that you build these mutually exclusive movements that undermine each other and we no. That you recognize each other and recognize the distinction and the uniqueness and the contribution each people have to make to the overall unified Ummah. So we should be cognizant of that. We should embrace this history. Because as I said, this is the biggest payoff for Muslims who might not be of African descent embrace this history. You're no longer Ill illegitimate in this country. No one who, who can't even speak English because of the Austrian accent I'm not referring to a former California governor or something like that. Can come to you and say, oh, you Muslims don't belong here. This is a Judeo-Christian country. I say, man, you need to go study some history and get out of my face. That's what happens when you embrace this history. You have roots right here. Deep roots that predate the establishment of the country itself. So this, this is history to be embraced, it's history to be celebrated, and it's a chapter in the book of the Ummah. It's a chapter in the book of the Ummah. And we're writing that together, collectively, all of us. We're writing that chapter. But that chapter has a very prominent section that's focused on this history. We have to embrace it. So I'll stop here and uh, take a few questions, comments. Bismillah. Sit down. Yes, sir. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Because the slaves couldn't have established educational institutes. Islam is a knowledge-based religion. Slaves could practice Islam if they had the courage, the fortitude, but they couldn't build madrasas, they couldn't build masjids, they couldn't build social institutions that are necessary to foster a communal existence. And so as long as new slaves are coming from Africa, there are new Muslims coming. Once you slavery is over, no more Africans are coming, therefore no more African Muslims are coming. And so then the uh, presence of Muslims due to death, another factor. You notice everyone I mentioned here was a man. Because most of the, many of the Muslim slaves, they were war captives. And so women weren't out fighting the wars. Therefore women weren't being kidnapped and sold into slavery at the rates of men. Many of these are also very pious people. They didn't want to marry a non-Muslim woman. Brothers, I'm just saying. They didn't want, <laughs> that ain't right. Uh, they didn't <clears throat> okay, let me sober up. Uh, so they didn't establish families. And that was another reason for the, once you stop bringing new slaves, the, com the presence begins to fade away and disappear. No institutions, a tendency not to marry if you couldn't find a Muslim wife. And there were far more Muslim men due to the nature of, of how slaves were tossed into, brought into bondage. And so as a result, it died out until the likes of Blyden began to uh, get people thinking about Islam in a positive light in this very now very staunch, staunchly Christian environment. And then the great migration creates those social spaces and dislocations that allow for the emergence of new forms of religious in the African American community. Does that make sense? Sisters, yes, one, two.
French, the French forcibly converted Muslims from the beginning. The Protestants early on, uh, generally because of the, this, this is all happening with the beginning of the Enlightenment. So freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, even in the First Amendment, which would come with the birth of this nation, they let the uh, Muslims practice. Later on with the emergence of the emancipation movements, they, they ironically, uh, the Quakers and other uh, emancipation societies uh, helped to breed in an atmosphere of intolerance that led to a lot of Muslims being forced by their argument was you're, you're kidnapping these people and then you're, you're letting them just live like pagans. You should be civilizing them. And, and so that aided to the beginning of forced conversion and then with the emergence of various evangelical movements amongst the Protestants, those led to a very strong proselytization and forced conversion of Muslim slaves. And in reference to what? What are you referring to? Uh, in the con... The first and second res resurrection? In what context? In context of the Enlightenment and... And conservative, yeah. The, the first awakening in that context. The first awakening. And so anyway, but still, despite that, you have Muslims who still practice their religion. As you mentioned, uh, some of these names that we mentioned. There was a notable Muslim woman. Uh, some of, how many of you are familiar with the book of the Negroes? Oh, you got it. Come on, people. What are you doing? You must be a nation of readers. Destroy your cell phone. It's, it's actually, it's a, uh, it's, uh, what do they call it, a historical novel, but it's rooted in facts. So it's, it's the story of, uh, I'm sorry. Book of the Negroes, where uh, there's a Muslim a young girl who's kidnapped along with her father. Actually, her father's killed with uh, a young man. They kidnapped, stolen into slavery. Her name is uh, Amanatu, so Amina. And uh, she's sold into slavery in around uh, Charleston, South Carolina owner's a Jewish person. Uh, she's able to gain her freedom. She goes to New York during the uh, Revolutionary War. New York was under the control of the British for a long time. The British offered asylum to any runaway slave. So a very large uh, colony or, or community of uh, runaway slaves established itself in New York. As uh, New York was falling to the Americans, the slave owners are coming to reclaim their property from the newly liberated city. So the British evacuated as many people as they could. And Amina was described because as a Muslim, she could write, who inscribed the names of the people the British were evacuating. And that book became that ledger became known as the Book of the Negroes. And I was blessed and fortunate in one of my trips to Canada to actually go to one of the archive li libraries and, and to search through it. I was looking for Muslim names in it. And so that was a, a Muslim woman who has, a, but generally you just had a, a far, far greater presence of, of men because of the conditions 
of, of slavery. Huh? Mashallah. Yeah, I just learned that from you. So that I'll incorporate that into the next year's presentation. Well, in the interest of time, I mean, you, it's Ali and Malcolm X, I think, but the three iconic figures, male figures, there are many iconic female figures, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, very, but the, the three iconic male figures, two are Muslims. Like, the, the big global icons, who was it? Malcolm X, I mean, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Muhammad Ali, globally. Of course, nationally, Medgar Evers, and many others. James Meredith, but that global, two of the three are Muslim. And so, I think their role, what, what Ali did, uh, is miraculous in the sense that he gave, he, he continued doing what Malcolm did. Malcolm gave a voice to people who have been beat down and dehumanized. And so they heard Malcolm like, how, how can that brother talk like that and not get killed? It's like, he could do it, I could do it. And once Malcolm was gone, Ali inherited that mantle. And Ali consciously, uh, he consciously cultivated uh, that platform. So Ali always said, boxing is a means for me to gain the stature that I need to preach Islam to the people. Ali was like a dai died in the wall through and through. So he said, boxing is just a platform to give me the celebrity status that will help me to preach Islam. And he actually, he wanted to be the Muslim Billy Graham. And he had 40 some odd speeches, like sit down for a week and put in the rhetorical flair. I mean, well-crafted speeches. I heard one, but I can't let anyone hear it. Anyway, my wife doesn't even know this. I just outed myself and they're filming. It's been destroyed, deleted. But I mean, he was serious about that. He wanted to be the Muslim Billy Graham. Like, I'm going to go out and preach Islam to the world. At the same level of Billy Graham, and he, he was sharpening his oratory skill. I said he wrote 40 some odd speeches to do just that. And then Allah took his voice. Qadrullah Mashaf Al. And uh, he realized that he would have to touch people in a different way. And he was able to do that uh, miraculously. So, yeah, Ali is, uh, is an icon. Those, these are not even one in a generation figures. These are once in a century figures. You know, that, that Allah brings up through a wisdom that He understands best to serve a purpose, and then they're gone. You catch them, you catch them. If you miss them, you miss them. But it could be anyone. That's why yani, it's, it's, it's very important. Allah inna awliya Allah. To have taqwa and faith. And Allah will use you in ways that you can never perceive. So that was, that was Muhammad Ali. And uh, mashallah, mashallah. Just a great, great, great uh, individual who cast a long shadow on this earth. And he was, uh, Ali had no bodyguards. I mean, he, he was the death threats. I mean, Malcolm was killed for less. Dr. King was killed for less. Ali's, I ain't going to fight your wars. You know, 
I'm gonna I'm not going to be your your stereotypical sport champion. I'm not gonna box exhibitions for your army. I'm not going to shut up and and Allah protect them and no bodyguards. He said Allah is my bodyguard. Well, yeah, and that endeared him to people. He was very threatening to the people in power. Because after Ali, what, what did Stokely Carmichael start telling people? Hell no, we won't go. Hell no. So Ali was threatening the, to, the, to the, the bad people. But it's very uh, uh, attractive to the good people. And all over, and, and what, what, look at Ali's life, like, at first he, he's champion of African American people, heavyweight champion, defiant, then he becomes Muhammad Ali, now he's the champion of the whole Muslim world, the Turks, the Bosnians, the Arabs, you name it, if it's a Muslim, Ali's your champion. He's fighting people up, watching the television, two in the morning, special broadcast. Then he opposes the war in Vietnam. Now he's the champion of the non-Muslim struggling masses throughout the so-called third world. And so you have a global, global figure from a little skinny kid from Louisville, Kentucky. Anyway. It's late. We can be here all night. Yes, the sister, you you had your hand up. This is the last question slash comment. Y'all love this one. Allahu Akbar. See? Well, Wolof, very strong people. Don't mess with them. Well, this is the second time in a week, so. <laughs> Allah barik you. Allah bless you. Bless your family. And uh, give everyone long life. It was a lot of barakah. And so we forge on. May Allah bless us. Bless our ummah. May Allah bring us together. Bring our hearts together. Bring our, our, our work together. And but bless us to, to recognize that it's, it's one army, but it has many battalions and divisions. So we're not all carbon copies of each other. That we have different histories and that we should celebrate and that we should respect. And, but we're, we're part of one ummah and we have one destiny. We have one mission, but that mission has different subsets and we all have a part to play. So may Allah bless everyone. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidin Mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira. Allahumma ja'al jam'ana hadha jam'an marhuma. Wa tafarruqana min ba'di tafarruqa ma'asuma. Wa la tara indana wa la fina wa la ma'ana shaqiyan wa la mihruma. Allahumma taqabbal minna zidna wa la tanqusna. Allahumma zidna ilman wa amalan wa rizqan halala. اللهم زدنا في خدمة لأخواننا وأخواتنا المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات اللهم إن نسألك الرحمة والعفو والمغفرة لمشايخنا وساتذاتنا ومعلمين ومربين ومهذبين ومؤدبين ومدرسين وكل من علمنا ولو حرفا 
فبارك لهم وارحمهم جميعا يا الله وزد الأحياء منهم في كل خير يا الله والأموات منهم يا الله فنور قبورهم ووسع قبورهم وعطر قبورهم وافتها في قبورهم نوافذ يرون خلالها مكانهم في الجنة واجعل قبورهم روضة من رياض الجنة يا الله وتقبل منا زلنا ولا تنقصنا اللهم فرج عن المسلمين في كل مكان وفي كل بلد اللهم فرج عن المسلمين وخفف عن المسلمين اللهم ثبت كل طاح قلوبنا وثبت أقدامنا واستر عيوبنا وأوقف هروبنا وتقبل منا جميعا يا الله أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ببركة القرآن العظيم وبحرمة من أرسلته رحمة للعالمين سيدنا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يعصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا للفاتحة